you. You know how on the internet there are like pages, like everything's categorized, and the headline was uh, "Cinema is a Game." I think I wanted to talk broadly at the beginning about your films as games. Yeah, you know this is the, the fault is uh, it's not my fault. It's the, uh, this. It's your. Uh, it's a Canadian guy, uh, Mark Perenson. He made this interview, and uh, in the context of this interview, I have said that I think that uh, uh, that cinema was a game. It's a game in the sense that uh, when you are making a film, for me, I don't believe that cinema uh, should try to reproduce reality. So you have to make up some rules like in games and so uh, there is the film there is the viewers uh, it's the viewers that not, does not mean the audience you know like like an abstract thing everybody is different and uh, the viewer each one of the viewers has to respond to what is proposed by the film with the rules of the film with uh, their own interests and their own uh, sense of humor and uh, whatever they have, you know? And so it's a, view, it's a game with the viewer. That's in In The Face You Deserve, uh, there's a moment where one of the characters says, um, kind of, goodbye, my friends, and, and all of the friends seem like they're governed by these kind of rules, though. So is there a point in the films where the rules no longer apply? Well, this uh, in the in the the rules of the game of the of this film, uh, our beloved month of August. Uh, in, in this film, there you have this character that disappears in the beginning, in the, like after 30 minutes of uh, being on the film, he disappears. He becomes sick, and the, his uh, sickness is uh, a sickness that uh, normally children have called measles, I think. And, uh, and so he has to, he, like, he, he is off, he does not appear in the film. He, we know that he's like in, a, in his bed, uh, shivering with a fever or something, and he's made up a new world, a world that connects with childhood. And, uh, and of course, the problem of, of this character is that he's very childish, you know, he does very childish uh, things. And I guess there is a moment in our life where all of us, we have to say goodbye, my friends, goodbye to childhood, goodbye to certain things we believed. And that in the process of aging and growing up, you start to lose these uh, things, which is not a very bad, uh, awful thing, but uh, it's something natural. Uh, of course, in a way, it's kind of sad, you lose some of the innocence. And sometimes, uh, at least me, I can regret losing the loss of this innocence. Uh, the time where you believe in things that you cannot believe anymore. And uh, in a way, cinema can allow you, in a way, to get this back. And uh, so in the case of this film, our, uh, The Face You Deserve, <coughs> the main character becomes ill, he disappears, he invents, he, and he invents a film, he's making up a film. He invents characters and uh, things they have to do and certain rules and uh, he goes, he plays along until the moment where these characters clash with each other and they disappear. And so the last sentence is goodbye my friends. And goodbye my friends is uh, yeah, goodbye to, the, to this moment, to this time where you can believe certain things. Is, uh, is cinema something that's also lost, though? Is it, uh, in cinema? A, yeah, like, well, the history of cinema as maybe something that you, um, is no longer available. No, I don't think so. I think that uh, 
uh, cinema exists and uh, the memory of cinema also exists and uh, the films that are being produced nowadays like always in the history of cinema there are lots of uh, bad films but you still have good films and uh, so I would not go that far and say you know like uh, there was uh, it was <coughs> in the 80s in the 80s there was this discussion uh, a little bit because of Godard that was saying that cinema ended that's not true uh, a certain cinema has finished yeah uh, but uh, the memory of this cinema, I hope it's alive. It's, it will be alive if we can still uh, be showing these films. Uh, of course, that these days we ask ourselves if this will, be, it will continue to be uh, possible. Because uh, you know that uh, because of the changing of... Uh, of uh, screenings in 35 millimeters to digital cinema there will be a moment where every cinema will be equipped with only digital uh, means and uh, so it will be tough to see most of the films because they don't have dcps so but only in cinema text they will so let's see how if the, the memory of cinema can still be alive it will be alive since uh, there will be a transmission if uh, if uh, the people nowadays can still see films shot in the past well there, there are different production limitations that exist now um, as you say like switching to digital and with uh, August, you, it started on 16 and then that was kind of scrapped, is, is that...? August, uh, no, it was uh, 16 all the time. It was, okay, uh, but there was like an initial plan of like a bigger maybe scope with a lot of extras that was kind of... There was no. a shift at, at some point? It was a, there was a shift, but not because of the material. Uh, okay. You no, know, because with the material... Uh, some. Uh, I say that uh, cinema is a game, but I, I, I can uh, sometimes I think that cinema is a little bit like hunting too. Uh, and, but uh, with the uh, one thing that it's uh, better there is that uh, no one is killed, supposedly. <laughs> but uh, uh, what happens is that I have the sensation, for instance, in the case of our beloved month of August, I prefer to have like uh, 16 millimeter stock, film stock, and to shoot with that, uh, then to, uh, to, to can be able to shoot uh, in digital. And this is because of hunting. When you go hunting, you have like a rifle and a limited uh, ammunition. So you cannot, you know, just shoot all the day. Uh, that is not good for me. I have to decide the, mo the good moment to shoot and it becomes part of the of doing films is to you know to bet on on certain things and just let down other things and uh, so the the shift in the, in our beloved month of august uh, occurred not because of uh, material of uh, shooting on digital or, or film but because of the lack of money there was a moment there is always a moment in my films where the producer appears and he just uh, says, okay, no money for the, this script. And then it's, uh, I get a little bit mad. Uh, and then I have two possible things to do. One is uh, to wait to get more money, which uh, normally does not happen. So. It's not uh, such a good idea, I think. And other possibility is, uh, you know, to try to reinvent the film while doing it, not just to 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 do like uh, uh, the same script you have imagined, but like uh, in a poor version. That's not a good option. So I think that. Uh, 
it's best to just try to reinvent the film while shooting it. And that's what happened in the, the case of our beloved month of August. So when you, when you changed the, the kind of structure of the film to include the filmmaking in it, was that something that was maybe, mm -hmm. I know that a bunch of people writing about the film jumped to that conclusion, the kind of tradition of films that are about filmmaking. But to me, it seemed to be more rooted in the fiction, non-fiction divide and the place that you were kind of documenting. That's, that's because you are very smart and I'm not that smart. So I will tell you honestly that I was not thinking about and fictional and non-fictional uh, while shooting or imagining what I could shoot. A little bit, maybe. But the main reason, it was because in the first part of the film, we didn't have a script. And so we, we have to shoot things that existed in that place. And so uh, lots of concerts, uh, these bands, uh, and karaoke sessions, and uh, this guy that jumps from the bridge, uh, Paulo uh, Muleiro, that the guy that jumps from the bridge, and so, and the people that lived in this place, and we talked with them and we filmed them, but there were some days where nothing happened, and so in these days I said, okay, uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to shoot with the crew because we are here, and so maybe we. We are part of this place too, because we are here. Since we are here, I, I don't have nothing to do, nothing is happening now, today, so let's, uh, you know, do a scene about you trying to shoot something, I don't know. Uh, I recall that the first day I've made that for our beloved month of August, uh, I asked them to, to do this, and uh, then uh, we were uh, next to, to like a little church with broken glasses, uh, windows. And so it has a, uh, a beautiful uh, acoustic. If you said, whoa, to the, in that window, it would be roar, roar. And so I, we have decided, uh, we, we shot it uh, the, as, uh, putting the camera, doing things, and then I said, okay, let, now let's sing a mantra. You know, a mantra, uh, I don't know if you say a mantra. Yeah. Let's sing a, a Chinese mantra. Uh, and uh, so we all uh, stood by this window, this broken window, and did the uh, and with all the crew, and the, the, the sound man was recording this from another window, uh, on the other side of the building and it was something uh, we, we didn't have much to do so we have recorded and it, you listen to this mantra in the like soundtrack in the, in the film and it uh, came up because we didn't have uh, much to do that day <laughs> but uh, it sounded good and so it's on the film. Was that the moment where the importance of the, the sound man came into the story? No, this uh, sound man is a very specific uh, sound man. Is a, even uh, now, the other day I was, uh, I was uh, giving an interview uh, with him in, and he was saying to the, uh, the guy, uh, the, to the journalist, that uh, the, he was so good he was so good that by the end of the film, he was explaining me, the director, what was my film. <laughs> and I said, okay, Vasco, you are going a little bit too far, you know, because don't you remember, we, we, we uh, made up this scene, you know? You, you remember, it was not a documentary, we were not really talking and there was like a camera by chance, the shooting. And so it's always like this. This is Vasco Pimentel, the sound guy. He has a very mythical approach of himself and uh, filmmaking. And so I, I uh, take profit of this uh, because uh, um, I knew that uh, it would be interesting to confront him in a film 
uh, with the fact that he could record sounded sound that does not uh, that uh, was not there. It was the discussion in the end of the film is a guy me playing the director and him playing the sound man, and I'm accusing him of uh, recording things that are not there. And uh, he explains to me that these things are there because he wants to. So he is able, like a magician, to uh, record things that he likes to hear, which is a good definition of cinema. Cinema is uh, uh, for us to have on films not only reality, but also our desires. Like, for instance, doing a Chinese mantra in the, a mountain uh, with the crew of the film. There is no Chinese mantras in this region, but there is not because we made it up. So it started to exist. And that's cinema. Uh, and it was a good way to, I thought always of this scene as a way to finishing this film because I knew it would be a, a long film. It's two hours and 30. And to end the film with this guy saying, okay, I will not record phantom sounds. Uh, I'm going to stop with this. And so he said, okay, I'm stopping with it. And then the film stops too. The film finishes. Because maybe you need these phantoms in cinema for going on. So it's, it's, it looked like a way to... to to a good way to, to finish this film. Now, are those the phantoms of the place or the phantoms you brought to it or both? Because like the, the film is very rooted in its, in its place. Are the, the titles that have the locations, the touring, the people? Yeah, but uh, it's a little bit, because cinema, I think it's like an equation between our desires and our desires is like, it, it, things we want to happen, you know? Uh, fictional characters and things we, we want to see in a film and we just make them up. And then reality, that's the other side of the equation. It, it means things that exist and that, I mean, a tree is a tree, a, a house is a house, a girl is a girl, a gun is a gun, things like this. So you have to have the things that exist and at the same moment, the things you want to exist in the context of making a film. And so they both come, come together. In, in the case of our beloved month of August, <coughs> it, it's in the, uh, the countryside of Portugal, in small villages that most of the time of the year, they have very few people living in, on it and people, very old people, because there are not many jobs uh, down there. And so most of the people left to, to work uh, in other countries, or at least to Lisbon and the, the, I mean, the, the cities in the, in the, by the sea coast. Uh, and, and in August, these people return to the villages. And so they kind of reinvent the place with all these uh, festivities, these uh, songs. Uh, I mean, you enter a village and there is belly dancers in, a, in the village. The, this village have never known belly dancers in every each uh, day of uh, the other days, there is no belly dancers. But because of the desire of uh, spectacle, of fiction of, uh, you know, of uh, the need of uh, we have of these things, then, and cinema, of course, then you can enter this village and you can see belly dancers in a village in the, in, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so the film is dealing with this idea that, that even in the context of a very specific uh, uh, culture and uh, a land, uh, uh, there is always a, desir a desire of something else. And in this month of August, it happens in, the, in, the, in these uh, villages. So 
like the what is telling Vasco that he, he can record things because he wants to, to see them, it's the same logical as these guys that have belly dancers, even if it's something that does not uh, uh, belongs to the, the cultural uh, environment we are in. So it's, it's the same. My favorite thing about the film is the structure and what you were just describing there made me think of how, you know, going from town to town, there are so many different stories in that film that it could stick with, but it doesn't. And it only eventually settles on one kind of love story to focus on. I was wondering at what point you determined that structure. Oh, that's, uh, <clears throat> okay, I'll tell you this story and then first we break. Okay. Uh, what happened is that, in, as I said to you, there is always a day where the producer appears and sets, says no money. And so when he said no money for the script you have, I, I guess I said fuck you. <laughs> uh, and then I was a little bit depressed because everything was you know, in motion to film, make the film. And then I said to myself, like two or three days after, I said, why the hell should I wait if, you know, these uh, festivities will take place in three weeks? So I went to him again and I said, okay, just give me a camera and uh, I want uh, like the minimum of people to, wo to work in a crew to make, uh, and I will film whatever I, I like, you know? And then uh, I will shoot during the festivities, so during the month of August, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to shoot. And then I will rewrite the script uh, accordingly to whatever I'm going to shoot uh, in the now. So I'll have to shoot, and then I'll have to edit what I'm, uh, a first uh, draft, of a uh, first version of, uh, of what I've shot. And then next year we'll go there with another script, a script you can afford, and then, uh, but it will be a bigger film. And so this was the moment, I think the moment where we make up this structure of uh, like the first part being almost like a, a casting of people that will reappear playing characters in the second one. No? And uh, uh, looking to knowing some places you can fi find out also in the second part, but in another context or seeing things, rituals that these people do during their festivities and seeing them after in the second part in the, as part of the context of, the, of a fiction uh, film. Uh, it was, I don't remember the precise moment, but it was something that I, I, I think that occurred in the end of the first shooting and the editing of, uh, of the, this first uh, version of the, of the first part. And now, break. <laughs> okay? Just part. One, two, three, four. So the structure of taboo is something everyone likes to talk about. Um, and there's starting to be this observation that the films are in two parts which doesn't really make sense to me, because I don't, I'm not sure if I agree with that with August. Um, but I think that's a good place to start with Taboo. No, but you don't be, it's, a, it's factual. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. You have two parts in the, the, the features. 
uh, but uh, the first time in the, the face you deserved it was meant to be that way in the our beloved it was an accident it was so the the, the original script was it didn't have two parts um, and in this case yeah it was meant to be that way uh, there was a day when uh, my producer appeared and he said no money for the script so again <laughs> I, I even if this time that's not on the film but the uh, African part of, of uh, the second part of Taboo it's uh, we invented we within the crew we have made like a group of people we came up with a group of people me uh, the assistant director uh, the editor uh, and the the co-writer of the film uh, and we made the, this group called the, the Central Committee and the Central Committee had the, the our job was daily in a daily basis during the shooting like came, uh, try to come up with a menu like in a ch Chinese restaurant you know mm -hmm where you have uh, numbers for each uh, dish to come up with this menu of uh, scenes. <laughs> and then every day try to decide, okay, let's erase this uh, number 24, 75, 112. Mm, they are no good. And uh, come up with new scenes accordingly to whatever we were shooting. So we knew already the story. Uh, I mean, in general terms, that uh, of course there would be lovers, two lovers, and uh, that she would get pregnant from the husband, and uh, so the general story we knew, but uh, uh, we just made up the scenes uh, during the shooting, and then we restructured the whole film by writing only the voiceover while editing the film in, in, the, in the end of the process. So there was the editor again, and also my co-writer, and we just <clears throat> uh, write and edit at the same time, you know? Uh, but anyway, the film was supposed from the beginning to be, to have two parts, and two parts that could uh, contrast uh, with each other, could uh, be a little bit the opposite. In, in the first part, you you, you have these uh, older women between 60 and 80, and uh, they are lonely women. They talk a lot. They seem uh, aware that the world is not uh, in a good state. Uh, and uh, in the second part, have young people. Uh, in love, doing uh, silly, sexy things, um, not talking uh, uh, because there is no, no dialogues in the, in, the in the second part of the film because it's a story told by someone and you don't get to hear the dialogues. And the characters seems, seem also completely unaware of uh, the political, social situation uh, in this uh, society. So they don't see coming the end of the colonial empire, the Portuguese. Uh, and um, so we had this structure from the beginning. And also, <coughs> one of the ideas I had was to come up with this very uh, eccentric old lady but that seemed to have a, a, a not at all interesting life and then just reinvent her like she was a starlet, uh, you know, like she was playing in a Hollywood film from the 40s or something. Uh, so the film was built like that from the beginning. Is it indebted in any way to kind of Hollywood, the classical model? I mean, from the older period even to like something like Ode of Africa? Yeah, it's well, and I never, uh, for instance, if in August film, it's this place where we have shot. It's a place where 
I've been since my childhood. I, I, I mean, I always lived in Lisbon, but this place uh, I have uh, a house, and so I spent pretty much of the vacations there. So I knew this place. I knew about, I mean, the the fire truck, the all the universe of this little part of the of this region. And Africa, it's something I, I, I never went to Africa before shooting this film. So uh, what you see in this film is the, like this imagery, a colonial imagery uh, we had about Africa and also the imagery cinema made up uh, about Africa, like this. So this is not the real Africa. This is kind of a mythological Africa, a view of uh, what cinema came up, you know, and of course mainly uh, American cinema. Uh, that uh, I know. I mean, from Tarzan films to yeah, these uh, films, uh, Mogambo, John Ford, uh, and. Our Ox films, uh, Atari, and of course out of Africa, why not? Uh, so in this Africa comes from this, uh, from a fictional world. So when when um, the the main character in the first part is watching the kind of Murnau esque film at the beginning, and then we as an audience are watching that second half, that is that kind of unreal reality and, and film reality. Is that a kind of identification, like she's in a similar position as the, the viewer would be? Yeah, like, I, I asked, for instance, the actress, Teresa Madruga, that plays uh, Pilar, yeah. who is always going to the cinema. And I asked her uh, in some uh, scenes, in most of the scenes, to be honest, uh, to, to look a little bit astonished by everything, uh, everything like, as he, when we are in a, in a film and we are into it, we are liking the film, we are a little bit like, no, well, seeing the film. And she, she's the kind of character that is looking to the others, watching the world, um, like it was a film, like, uh, because she does not consider herself like, uh, she con I guess she considers the, uh, herself like a very normal people, a very no normal per person. So she's like a viewer. She's like uh, she's not acting on the film. And, and uh, you know, the actress that does Aurora, I asked the opposite. I remember that in in some uh, situations I was asking her to do like uh, I said to her, okay, a little bit more Vincent Pri Vincent Price. You know, when she was like talking about uh, the things, uh, she's doing witchcraft and things like this. And I said, okay, don't be afraid, Laura, more Vincent Price. <laughs> and she was having fun, but the, the logical of this character is like to, to perform, to act. And she's always, she's like a starlet, changing her clothes in every scene and trying to impress the others. And Pilar, yeah, it's like the viewer. And so she's watching a little bit uh, in a state of astonishment, uh, looking to the acting of the other people. And her reactions to, to the, the young Polish girl who's coming to Lisbon, I mean, that's a, it's a component of the film that I'm not, I'm not seeing as many people commenting on, but it's interesting to me because it, it roots Lisbon as a a place that people go to and people live in before taking the film completely to Africa. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> for me it was important to have uh, for Pilar that she could be abandoned from the beginning of the film. So she's like someone that uh, needs to be, uh, to have like a family. She can be like a mother or a daughter, a mother of uh, a Polish Catholic woman that goes there for a, a Catholic meeting or something, and uh, <coughs> be like the the daughter of Aurora that 
does not pay any attention to her. So, so she's like in stress, trying to, to, to gain a place, to, to, to be responsible for something. And, uh, but she does not seem to go very far. And she, of course, she has this, also this uh, kind of uh, failed uh, romance with this uh, very bad painter that because she's a very nice uh, woman, a very uh, altruistic uh, woman, but there are limits, you know? <laughs> it is, it's, so, it's such a pain in the ass that uh, there is not a possibility of, of uh, them to be really a couple. Um, but I wanted to have this kind of, uh, in the first part of the film, this kind of, uh, vague sensation of things that things are not going well, you know? Uh, that uh, these uh, characters are a little bit uh, like prisoners uh, of something. Of, uh, maybe their lost age, their youth, the, they are missing that, that for sure. Uh, and uh, Lisbon, which is uh, seen in cinema most of the times like a very shiny, uh, sh uh, beautiful city. Except for Pedro Costa's. Yeah, that, but yeah. <laughs> Pedro Costa, yeah, he's doing uh, other neighborhoods in Portugal. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to have this, this yeah, the, like a, a very old aged, dark city. And uh, then go back to Africa and uh, to a more brighter place and uh, if things are so great in the first half is is the second half maybe positioned as something that maybe would be what people have nostalgia for but the, the reality is that it's not what they remember like is that why there's that kind of stylistic shift where you have even if the people that compare that section to silent cinema, it's not even silent cinema because you've got the Foley, you've got the, the long, long voiceover. They kind of make it not the past, but kind of the past. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the, the socio-political stuff is pushed away. It's, it's kind of like how nostalgia works where you're trying to remember the good things, but you kind of leave out the, the bad. <coughs> well, I, th I, I thought of it uh, as uh in the second part as something that, where you see white people, uh, you know, flirting and uh, betraying uh, and killing each other. And so having the time of their lives. Uh, and this was kind of dysfunctional, you know? Uh, and then, of course, that uh, it's, it's like the, the absence of the political context of the because the war is going to, to start because the the people the africans there in the are going to ask to to fight for their independence as a country uh, you don't get to see because you see characters that are playing in a hollywood film and this is politically something important because in Portugal, Portugal was the last country in Europe to give away, to give the, the independence to the, to the colonies. Everybody, the other countries, have already done that. And Portugal was the last one. Uh, only in 74, after the Portuguese uh, revolution that uh, stopped with the fascist regime we had till 74, in Portugal, we had a colonial war between 62, 63, and uh, and uh, 74, the time of the revolution. And so uh, these guys playing like doing these uh, things you get to see in the second part, they are almost like playing a film, completely unaware or unable or unwilling of looking uh, to the exterior, 
they are completely, you know, uh, in the context, the, they are just looking to each other, not looking to the political and social situation at, uh, at that time. And so what I have in the film is like these guys living a out of Africa kind of film, but she's pregnant. And th this pregnancy, I think it's like, a, a, you know, a bomb, one of these bombs with a, that has the time yeah. ticking. And uh, this was the same political situation that we were living in Portugal in that moment. It was completely impossible to maintain this kind of regime, colonial regime, in the 60s and in the 70s. So this affair they have is so dysfunctional as the regime where they lived because uh, there would be a moment where the bomb would explode, would explode. And so it's <coughs> because of that, that the, in the climax uh, of the film, when they break up, uh, then Africa takes over, then uh, Suddenly, there is this uh, speech in the radio of someone uh, saying that, uh, making a political statement, uh, uh, claiming that uh, it, uh, it was the independent, uh, the independentists that uh, killed a, a guy that we see in the film. It's not killed by by by, by them and, uh, and uh, almost claiming the independence. It comes at the same moment. So it's like the, the, this Hollywood film, it is going to end not in a good way, it's going to end, and then Africa takes over. And they are all expelled from their paradise, what they think is the paradise. Is that why there's the POV shot of the, the murdered person? Yeah, I wanted to to go in the in that last section of the film into a more uh, absurd uh, situation. So have things are getting more and more uncontrolled, and at, at this moment you have like there is someone that is dead, and you have like this this. Uh, uh, point of, the point of view of the dead, uh, uh, seeing Aurora that is starting to have, uh, how do you call it, uh, the baby is starting to being born. This is kind of uh, absurd, melodramatic uh, things you have in, on cinema. And it will end, and so you have this kind of uh, shot with uh, because the guy is lying like this, so you have the camera also like this, and then you have the last shot which is the Africans looking at them and now the camera now it's it's again on their normal in its normal place and so it's like uh, yeah it's the Africans they are looking these crazy white people doing stuff uh, bizarre stuff killing each other and and uh, yeah it's it's the beginning of uh, Africa taking over well, it also implies that there are, there are local stories, like if this is a story that's being told from one Portuguese person to another, or a group of people, at that point you're aware that there are, some, there are different stories that are native to, to Africa that we're, we don't have access to as viewers. Especially with some of the dance and, and the song that happens. Especially even juxtaposed against the, the music in the second half, where music kind of takes over. Yeah, that's true. It's, uh it's uh, the last after after this the, when they break up. You have this tracking shot of uh, of uh, of the car where Aurora is is going, and he, he, you see Ventura being lost, and you have these kids running after the car. And uh, yeah, from that moment on, there are no more white people on the film, and. Uh, no more Italian pop songs or Phil Spector songs. You don't. Uh, it's finished. You have a a, a 
African uh, music and you have uh, this declaration of uh, almost a declaration of war and then the epilogue being told by, by, by Ventura but you just see the Africans and the crocodile. And the crocodile, this is one thing I definitely wanted to talk about because at the start the crocodile is described in the kind of Murnau's film as being eternal along with the ghost of the the explorer eaten and I was wondering if like the crocodile functions in that way kind of like a marker of eternity or or time or yeah maybe maybe but uh, I found out only later that uh, I mean it looked always like uh, like uh, yeah something that is connected with like a, a frustrated love or a tragic a love that finishes in a wrong way in a tragic way but then i understood that uh, maybe it had a connection yeah with uh, with time and memory with with uh, a witnesses uh, uh, all maybe they witnessed uh, all these uh, people getting in love and falling up, uh, apart and uh, and all the empires that uh, were built and then also they finished so it's like the memory it's like cinema no it's uh, uh, it's and it looks very prehistorical the crocodile so it must remember things that people are have already forgotten. So, but I was not thinking about that when I was shooting the film. I was only uh, thinking that I like crocodiles. <laughs> Thank you, Miguel. Thank you.